I'm Andy. I want to welcome you to Wellspring. If you're new today, you picked a fantastic day to get out. So God bless you for that. Uh, if you're a, a long timer, you know, fan, great. This morning, I wondered, we have uh, over 50 guys up at, the, at White Mills at a men's retreat, and the rain was so terrible, I thought it may be a really low number today. I don't think we'd had room for the men's retreat, so God bless you guys for getting out. So thank you for coming, and uh, it's really great to have you here today. Uh, again, I'm Andy, one of the guys on staff. I'd love to meet you, just get to know you a little bit. If, if you could help me with that, that would be great. We're in, the, in a series we've called Greater, or these last weeks where we've talked about how Jesus is greater than everything else we're going to deal with. And we've used the book of Hebrews as a kind of a guide through that, through that process. And we're getting ready to take a break, like we'll do today, and then we're going to take a couple-week break leading up to our anniversary, and then we'll come back and finish a couple weeks on Hebrews to finish out the book. It's been a fun study, uh, at least for me. It may not have been fun for you, but it's been fun for me. So if it's not been fun for you, I apologize. I, we're doing the best we can. But it's been fun to walk through that. And today, we are the last day for a few weeks that we're going to jump into this passage. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Hebrews chapter 10. It's page 843 in the Bibles there in your seats. If you don't have one with you, take one of those or look on the app or, or whatever. That would, be, that would be fantastic. Hebrews chapter 10. Now, today, I want I wanted to just encourage you. You've already been through some challenges to get here. You got through the weather, and apparently your duplex has flooded a, a spot or two. Is that right? Anybody else do it? Yeah, so that's kind of exciting. Uh, normally duplex is such an easy route, but today apparently it's a little more challenging. So you guys have made it and you're here. And so I hate to put one more challenge on you, but I'm going to have to do that right up front as a warning to you. Today's message is a little weird. I mean, more than normal. I'm a little weird just with my personality, but it's a little more than normal. And it, the best way I can describe it to you, it's like when you're making a dessert or a casserole, if you've ever done that, where you, you'll get at your counter and you've got like the base a crust or whatever that you're putting down, and then it, the recipe says you got to go over here and mix these three or four things together, and you come back and you put it on top of the casserole, and then you go back and mix three or four more things together, and you put it back together. You know what I'm talking about? Like a, a layer deal. Well, this message is kind of a layer deal. So the problem is you don't have a recipe in front of you, so you don't, you don't have that. You're just going to have to trust me that I'm going to get us there, and we're going to have a, a casserole or a cake or whatever. At the end of this, you just got to trust me because I promise you, about halfway through, you're going to think, he's, he's kind of lost it. He's gotten a little wet, and he's, he's missed out on what's going on. But I'll land the plane if you stick with me. I can, I can promise you that, okay? Hebrews chapter 10 is where we're going to use as a basis for the message today, starting in verse 11, page 843. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11 says, Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties, Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Now, let me give you a picture. What he's going to do in this passage is describe Jesus compared to religion. Jesus greater than religion. This is critical, because some of you may have thought that was all the same thing, and he really distinguishes those. So day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God... And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he's made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I'll make with them, that after that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts, and I'll write them on their minds. And he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. But where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sins is no longer necessary. Now, we could take several weeks and just walk through those verses, because in those verses, he gives such a clear picture of how religion is, and how Jesus is, and how Jesus is greater than religion. So we could take weeks and just, just dive into that, and there would be plenty to deal with there, but we don't have time to do that. So I want to give you a chart, just to give you a, a snippet. Uh, so we're going to build the chart, and at the end, if you want a picture of it, some people did, took a picture first hour, so you can have that, or you can get a, a copy of it, maybe we'll post that or something. But just to give you a picture of how religion compares to Jesus. So in religion, he says, it's day after day. I mean, every day, you've got to come back and try to do it again, and make it right again, and be enough again. With Jesus, it's once for all. Jesus did something that covered it. With religion, they stand and perform. You've got to put on some pretense. You've got to be good enough for God. You've got to put on an act or a performance, some religion. Where Jesus sits, he rests in his completion. It's over. He did it. Religion can never take away sins. Jesus has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. With religion, you try to be, appear holy on the outside. You've got to put on your Sunday best. You've got to put on a good look. You've got to make sure you try to hide your sins and fake it when you can't. With Jesus, you're being made holy on the inside where only he can do the work. 
religion, you have law on stone tablets, the Ten Commandments and all that kind of stuff. With Jesus, you have laws on the hearts and minds of people. He, he changes the way we think and how we feel to, to live in his path. With, with religion, you have priests interceding for the people. So a priest would go to the people, they would hear the complaints of the people, the sins of the people, they would take those to God, and then they would come back from God with words for God, from God for, for the people. With Jesus, you go directly to God through Jesus. He opens the pathway. You don't ever need anyone else to be in between you and God. With religion, sin and lawful acts, lawless acts are addressed every day. I mean, churches have to bring up over and over the, the sins of the people and how that's so wrong. With Jesus, sin and lawless acts are remembered no more because he's paid for those. This chart is very good news because Jesus came to set us free, not only from our own sin and mistake, but from the, the constant pressure of religion. It's a beautiful picture. I mean, some of us came in here this morning constantly trying to be enough, trying to please God, to do enough, to change enough, to serve enough, to be enough. And, and that's a great contrast to the work of Jesus because it's very different than that. You know, on your own, on my own, you better stick to the chart on the left because we serve a, a perfect almighty God who's a harsh judge. And on your own, on my own, we're going to stand before him and we're broken, we're a mess. And religion reminds us of that day after day, over and over again. It drives us to achieve for God, to win over God's good graces. But Jesus is so different. Romans chapter 8 says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus the law of the Spirit who gives life has set us free from the law of sin and death. There is no condemnation, none, zero condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. If you've given your life to Christ, you are now free of condemnation. If you've not, you're still on the chart on the left, and we need to work through that and show you who Jesus is. But if you've given your life to Christ... Jesus, through his one act, dying on the cross, rising again to life, Jesus has once and for all paid for all of my sins and all of yours if you've given your life to Christ. We've been made perfect forever, even while he's making us holy on the inside. He's declared us holy, declared us perfect while he's making us holy. We don't need to go to God through religion. You don't need to go to God through me, through a pastor, through a priest, through a rabbi. You can go directly to God through faith in Jesus Christ. It's such a cool picture. Such good news. I want us to focus on verse 14, kind of a key verse there. I'll put it on the screen for you. It says, for by one sacrifice, Jesus has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. I wanted to show it to you because it's, it's a little bit of a dichotomy. It doesn't seem to make, there's a little bit of a play on words there. Do you catch that? He, he is made perfect forever, those who are being made holy. Made perfect, done. Being made is an ongoing process. It feels a little contradictory. Did you catch that? I mean, you and I are simultaneously perfect and a work in progress. Now, your spouse has told you for years that you're a piece of work. This is different than that, but Jesus is acknowledging that, yes, you are a piece of work, and you're perfect at the same time. I mean, it's all at the same time. He has made us perfect forever, while he's making us holy on the inside. Such a great picture for me. You know, Philippians 2 reminds us of this, that we've been given salvation as a gift, but now we've got to work out that salvation into every part of our life, into the way we think and act and feel and talk and, and live. Work it out into every part of our life. That's what this passage gives us a picture of. Salvation is a gift, but now we've got some work to do. You and I have been given a new name, a new identity, a new home. It's like we've changed addresses, but we've still got boxes in the garage. Not that any of you would know what that feels like, but you've changed addresses. You've moved, but you've still got some unpacking to do. You've got your new house, but it's not home yet. You've got to continue to work this out. You know, this passage in Hebrews 10, there's so much about it that tells us things that are just true of us. So much there. Jesus declared that we are perfect in the eyes of God. I don't know what you feel like when you stand before God or when you speak to God or when you think about your own sin, but if you've given your life to Christ, you are perfect in the eyes of God. He's declared that our sins, he'll, he's forgotten. He won't remember them anymore. He's declared that he is setting us apart, making us holy. He's declared so much, but there's more in this passage. I need us to dig in, and this is where I'm going to lose you. I apologize ahead of time, so stick with me. I need us to dig in because there's some more stuff in there. Let's go backwards through the verse. Look at verse 13. Verse 13 says, since that time, 
Jesus waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. He waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. What enemies is, is he talking about here? What enemies is the writer describing? There's debate, as there is on almost anything. You get in the, in the commentaries and things, there's debate on who the enemies are, but uh, what's he describing? And does Jesus really put his feet on them? Like, is, are they literally a stool there in the throne room of heaven with Jesus got his feet up? That seems a little bit weird. We'll come back to that in a second. Just leave that over here. We're building the cake. We'll set it right there. Verse 12 Let's, let's go backwards a little further. Verse 12 says, When this priest, Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since that time he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. He sat down at the right hand of God, the place of greatest honor, throne room of heaven, overseeing the universe, and there at the right hand of God is Jesus. It's a major theme throughout Scripture, that Jesus lowered himself. Jesus became a servant Jesus endured even the cross. He lowered himself and lowered himself and lowered himself. So then God raised him up to the highest place. Philippians 2 says, Therefore God exalted Jesus to the highest place and gave him the name that's above every name. That the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that he's Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now I highlighted the word exalted there. This passage was written after Jesus, but 2,000 years ago, roughly. And yet it's in the past tense. So it's not that God will one day exalt Jesus at the end of time. God's already exalted Jesus now. He is in charge of the universe. He is declared king of all kings. It's already happened. So hang on to that. We're going to set that over here too. We're, we'll build this thing together. Look at verse 12 again. When this priest had offered up for one time sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and he's waiting for his enemies to be his footstool. So I don't know that, that literally means he's sitting at the right hand of God. Sitting, ask any physician, sitting 24 hours a day is not really good for your health. So I don't think Jesus is literally sitting there 24 hours a day. I think the language is more figurative. Sitting at the right hand of God. Sitting because the work is done. At the right hand of God because it's the place of highest honor. So then when it says in verse 13 that his enemies are his footstool, I don't think you should expect a, a line of enemies defeated waiting their turn to be the footstool for Jesus. I don't think it's literal there either. It's figurative language. Now, just to give you a picture of how weird I am, when I was going through this this week, the picture I had in my head was of the old cartoon sheepdogs. You remember those guys who would clock in to watch the sheep? Like I'm picturing Jesus' enemies clocking in to get, you know, bend down and be the footstool. I don't think that's the picture we're seeing but I thought you should know your pastor's a dork. So I just wanted you to kind of pick up on that. So I, I may be wrong on this, but this doesn't seem like Jesus to me. Jesus is the one who lowered himself and became a servant, lowered himself to go to the cross. He even lowered himself to wash the dirt and grime and filth off his disciples' feet. Even Judas and Peter, who would deny him and betray him. So now that Jesus is in charge, I don't think he's going to make him come back and be the footstool. I, I think it's figurative language here. The enemies of God utterly defeated, recognized by all in their defeat, while Jesus sits at the right hand of God. It's a clear picture. And you need to make sure you grab that, so we'll, we'll leave that here as well. Now look at verse 14 again. Let's put them together. Verse 12 when this priest, Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since that time he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice he's made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The word for, some translations use the word because. So because uh, he's made for one time his followers perfect, those who are being made holy, because of that, now he sits in heaven at the right hand of God. Now he sits in heaven waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool. There's a connection between 12 and 13 and 14. Do you see that? Have I lost you yet? I'm like right on the verge of losing you. Just stay with me. There's a connection there. What is the connection? How does Jesus' sacrifice address the enemies of God? How, how, does, how does Jesus making perfect forever those of us who are being made holy, how does that take his enemies and place them in a place of utter defeat for everybody to see. How are they connected? I'll get to that, I promise. Just hang on a little bit longer, and I'll get there. Let me ask you one more question. One more little thing I need to mix up off to the side, and I'll bring it back, all right? What do angels do? You ever thought about that? Angels, what do, what do angels do? There's a, a lot of description about angels in heaven. Normally, in, in our day, we think of angels as chubby little buddies sitting on clouds, playing harps, or shooting arrows, or some nonsense. 
this is not from a study Bible or anything. That's not true. It's not a picture of heaven. And now to be fair, the reason they're chubby is because they're sitting on clouds all day, not so good for the metabolism. But I'm, I'm thinking this is not an accurate picture of what an angel is. What, what do angels say, if you've read about angels in, in the Bible, what do angels say the first thing, almost always, when they meet somebody, what do they say? Fear not, do not be afraid. Why do they say that? Because they're fearful beings. They're big and strong and intimidating. When people encounter an angel and see them with their eyes, they're really scared. And so they, they have to say to them, hey, I'm not going to hurt you. Don't be afraid. So they're big and they're intimidating and they're powerful, but what do angels do? If it's not arrow shooting and harp playing, what do angels do? We read multiple things in Scripture. They worship God. They do some other things here and there. But the primary thing they do is they're messengers. They take messages from God to us, his people. They deliver messages from the throne room of heaven to us. The Bible says that Satan was also an angel. He was the worship leader in heaven. And somewhere along the line, he wanted the worship for himself. So he said, stop worshiping God, start worshiping me. And a third of the angels thought it was a good idea and went with him. Revelation 12 says the great dragon was hurled down. The ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled down to the earth and his angels with him. If you read earlier in that chapter, his angels represent a third of the angels who said, yeah, maybe Satan should be in charge. And God kicked them out of heaven as well. Now, why does that matter? Because they're still primarily messengers. That's what they do. These fallen angels... These enemies of God are messengers, but their messages have now changed. Their messages used to be, you can trust God, believe in his words, be strong and courageous, have faith, have no fear. That's what they used to say, but now their messages have changed. We see it all the way through scripture. It leads the whole world astray, Revelation, Revelation said. The first pages of the Bible show us two of their primary messages that we then see over and over throughout the Bible and in, into our lives. Do you remember the story in the first pages of the Bible, Adam and Eve are in the garden? God set this perfect environment for them, everything they could ever want, no sin, a great relationship with each other and with him. And God says, I just ask you to do one thing. Just trust me enough to not eat from this one tree. Trust me, this is a bad idea to eat from the tree. Anything else is fair game, just, just don't do that. So Satan comes along as a messenger with messages not to honor God, but his own messages as God's enemy to fool us. And his first message to Eve and to us is that sin's not that bad. Eve tells the serpent, we can't eat from that tree. God said, don't do that. And he said, no, it's not that bad. You're not going to die. You, won't, you will certainly not die, he said to the woman. Sin's not that bad. It's not that big a deal. Don't trust God. Trust me. Why do you think Eve ate the apple? Have you ever thought about that? We were having a conversation about that at my house a few weeks ago. Uh, me and my wife and our four daughters were having a conversation about this and how so many women have such painful realities, the Bible says, because of this one sin, pain in childbirth, other things we're not going to mention. And so we, we had this conversation. When I say we had this conversation, I didn't say a word, but they had a conversation, <laughs> and I was in the room at the same time as they're having this conversation. And they're saying, you know, when they get to heaven, they want to go talk to Eve and say, what's up, Eve? What, what, why do we do this? And they're thinking maybe there's a line of women wanting to talk to Eve when they first get to heaven. I don't know if that's true or not, but why would Eve do that? Why would, why would Eve cause so much pain to so many ladies for a bite of fruit? No apple's that good. Why would she do it? Because she believed the message. She believed the lie that Satan had delivered to her. She'd become convinced that sin, disobeying God, wasn't that big a deal. That God, at least in this area, couldn't be trusted. Now, maybe other parts of the garden, you can trust God in those parts. But on this one part, maybe God's a little dated, or maybe God doesn't understand, or maybe things have changed, but you can't really trust God here. Maybe other places, but not here. And man, he tells us the same thing. Satan's second message for Eve and for us is that you can decide for yourself. You can be in charge. Verse 5 says, God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. You can decide what's right and wrong. You can decide what's good and what's evil. You can be in charge like God is in charge. You can have that for you. 
And today, all these years later, Satan and his messengers keep delivering the same messages to us. Sin's not that big a deal, and you can decide what's right and wrong. So what's that have to do with Hebrews 10? I'm going to bring this back and put this together. What's this have to do with Hebrews 10? What does it have to do with Jesus having a footstool of his enemies? How does that go together? Well, let's pull the verse up again. It says, For by one sacrifice, Jesus made perfect forever those who are being made holy. For because, because Jesus made this one complete sacrifice that made his followers perfect, that continually sets us up as holy and set apart for God, because he did that, when word of that gets back to heaven, reports about us, people, Living for God in a broken world, as, as reports of that get back into the throne room of heaven, Jesus is lifted up as a victor, and Satan is made low, a figurative footstool underneath Jesus' nail-scarred feet. As you look through Scripture, you, you, you'll see Satan not only delivering messages to us, he does that, his angels do that, he also delivers his messages to God himself. You know, he tells us, sin's not that big a deal, he tells us that you can be in charge. I can be in charge. He tells God that they won't be faithful. They won't follow you. They really won't. In Job chapter 1, he says, Does Job fear God for nothing? Talking to God. Stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he'll surely curse you to his face. So God sends out messengers saying, You can trust God. And Satan sends out messengers saying, You can decide for yourself what's right and wrong. You don't need to trust God. And then all of heaven watches us. What are they going to do? Who are they going to believe? Who's going to be in charge for them? And when you and I choose to follow, when we choose to believe in God, even when we don't see him working, when we choose to trust God, even when it seems difficult to believe him, when we choose to love God by loving those around us, even those that are hard to love, we put the majesty of God on full display. And as word gets back to heaven about what we've done, and it does, and when God and those watching see how we handle things, and they do, Jesus is lifted up as the victor, and Satan has made a footstool, an enemy, for the people of God. Scripture tells us this very clearly. Paul's writing to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 3, and he says, God's purpose in all of this life was to use the church, us, God's people, to display his wisdom and its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. So God is a wise God, and his angels are delivering his message, and he wants the heavens, all of heaven, to see us hearing that message and believing that message even when we deny the others. And when we do, when word gets back, Jesus lifted up and Satan has made a footstool. And scripture teaches that God is watching us, watching to see if my heart and yours are fully his. Even now, Jesus is watching. Is their heart fully mine? And when our hearts are fully his, and when word of that gets back to heaven, and it does, then God uses that to teach all of the heavens that we trusted him, that we could be trusted because we followed his message. And this passage here goes a step further. Hebrews goes a step further and says when that happens, that Jesus throw, leans back and puts his head, hands behind his head and kicks his feet up on, on the his nail-scarred feet on the back of Satan and all of his malicious lies. He says, look there. Look at their hearts. Look at their beautiful hearts. You know, sometimes people make too much of, too little of Satan. They do that sometimes in churches. I've always been bothered by the little kids' songs that sometimes we teach our kids. You may have heard some of these. We don't teach them here, so you may not have heard them here, but sometimes we'll teach, the churches teach a little song about uh, punching Satan in the face and putting him in a little red box and things. I think that's really kind of a dangerous little song to teach our children. He's a powerful being worthy of our respect. So sometimes people make too little of Satan, but other times people make too much of Satan. Like Satan can control us. Or Satan can force us to do things that we don't want to do. No evidence of that in the Bible at all. Not a single shred of evidence. He is powerful, but he's on a chain. And God is in charge. But there's a lot of evidence of Satan convincing us, God's people, that God can't be trusted. 
And then we, you and I do all kinds of stupid things on our own. He didn't force us to do that. We just followed his advice and did stupid things on our own, all by ourselves. He convinced us that sin wasn't that big a deal. He convinced us that this particular sin won't cause chaos in our lives like every other kind of sin does. He convinced us that we can decide for ourselves, that we can be in charge, we can be God. Lots of evidence of that description. And Scripture says that one day, one day, God's going to put an end to all of that chatter. There's only going to be one message coming out of heaven one day. And we will see with such great clarity like we've never seen before the true nature of our powerful, mighty God. And we will see with eyes wide open that all of those other messages were garbage, rubbish, just designed to hurt us, to lead us astray, to make us do stupid things. And that one day, Jesus will lean back, hands behind his head, nail-scarred feet propped up on all of those terrible lies. And for once for all, he'll be lifted as the victor, and Satan will be utterly defeated. And one day, Scripture says that Jesus won't be the only one with a footstool. One day, you and I will be able to prop up our feet on all of those malicious lies of the enemies of God. Romans chapter 16 says, The God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath your feet. And that's going to happen, friends. And you're going to know that all of those other lies were garbage, that Jesus is the way. He's greater than all of these things. And until this verse is true, until that, it will be, but until that verse is true, I want you to challenge you to see Satan's lies for what they are. Garbage, meant to lead you astray, meant to, to have you doubt a loving God who gave everything for you, who sacrificed his life so that you could be made perfect in his sight, declared that way right now, even as he's making you holy. And until this verse is true, I want to challenge you and I to set our hearts and our minds not on the things of this earth, not on all of those lies and stories that we've been told, but set our hearts and our minds on things above where God even now is watching. Watching to see who you're going to listen to. Watching to see if you can be trusted, if I can be trusted. Watching if we can be his star witness. The courtroom of heaven waits to see what we'll do. And one day, it's not going to be a question one day we'll all know this is true. One day we'll all know what's true and real and what's a lie. And we'll know that the words of God can be, always have been trusted. But now, now it's by faith. And now he watches to see what you'll do. And now he watches to see what I'll do. He's looking for somebody. A man, a woman, a child whose heart is completely his. May that be true of us. May that be true of us. Why don't you bow your heads and let me pray for you this morning. God, this, this passage gives us such a clear dichotomy that's so true in my life. On one hand, God, you raise up a picture of Jesus and what he calls us to, this vision for my life, this grand vision of you declaring me perfect and making me holy. And you call me, God, to... to to sort through the, the lies and the truth, to believe your words and distract, let everything else that's a distraction fall away. Till one day, you and I can sit on that pile of garbage that, that we've trusted for so long and know that you are always right and you are always true. And I will be made holy, even as you've declared me perfect. But God, on, this other, on the other side, this passage tells me how far I've fallen. I don't live up to that at all. I'm perfect, not because I am, but because you've declared it to be true through the blood of Jesus. And your grace stands so stark to my sin. God, in this room, we have so many of us who just know that we fall short of, of what you want for us. And we're humbled and we're grateful. Because God, you know us, you know me, you know all my junk and flaws, and yet you've declared that I am perfect forever in your sight. Because of Jesus. God, some of us are here and, and we're doing it on our own. We're following all the chart on the left. We're being as religious as we can be, and we know we're falling short. And we've never accepted the grace that you offer.
through Jesus. We've never accepted your forgiveness and your love. We've never allowed you to be the leader of our life. And today's that day for some of us. Church, wherever you find yourself, would you lift up your voice to God? Would you pray to God just now in your own words, just you and him? Place your life in his hands. Receive the grace that he so willingly offers. Pray to him and then I'll pray for you as well.